thank you Nicole. Hello everyone and welcome to Understanding Light and Value in a Landscape. I am your instructor Adrian Hodge and uh, tonight's class is a standalone class but it does lead into our class uh, for next week which will uh, keep building on the ideas that we're covering in tonight's class but uh, use gouache to understand light and value in a landscape using gouache. So tonight we'll be using graphite. And then next week's class, we're gonna be making something in a watercolor sketchbook that looks very similar to what we're gonna be sketching out tonight in our sketchbook. So if you haven't signed up for next week's class, make sure you uh, check that out. And Nicole has uh, the, the link to that class in the, the chat. And if you're watching later on YouTube, you can just search on uh, the Michaels website, or you can search uh, online classes with Michaels and uh, you'll see that class listed there. Um, understanding light and value in a landscape using gouache and you'll, you'll see that image that I just shared. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and switch to my tabletop view and we'll dive right in talking about supplies. So you may have something that might resemble this sketch in your sketchbook by the end of tonight's class, and you're hopefully going to have a great understanding of, of light and value in a landscape, even if your, your sketch does not uh, quite reach this level by the end of the class. Um, and don't forget to tag your work with the hashtags make it with Michaels, Michaels classes. You can also hashtag learn with Michaels. I need to add that to my little post it here. Um, and Michaels is on Instagram at learn with Michaels, um, as our lovely moderator just mentioned. And um, you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. And I am going to drop my uh, link tree in the, the chat for you all. Um, if you wanna check out some other stuff that I have coming up independently, independent of Michael, you can also uh, find that link tree in my bio on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. I'm also on Facebook, Adrian Hodge Fine Art. And here's some of my business cards. I'm always flashing on the screen real quick with that information, but I've got this online draw club that I've started on Saturday mornings on Zoom, which several folks from Michaels have joined me for. And those are really fun, very community-based classes where we are building our drawing skills and uh, being very collaborative. The one that I have coming up uh, this Saturday is a, um, still life swap. So you send in a still life photo uh, and then um, I'll send you a still life photo of another participant. We're going to draw each other's still life photos. So you can find that through my link tree, which I just dropped in the chat, or you can find it through my Instagram right there. Okay. So, um, and then our supplies for tonight's class are really simple. Next week, we're going to have uh, the gouache and I'll, I'll show that little product for next week's class again. You can see it's very similar to our, our sketch for tonight using the same reference photos and uh, building on the concepts we'll be covering tonight of uh, light, black and white, and then inverted light using two different colors in gouache next week. Um, but this week we are keeping it really simple. So I just have this little Canson sketchbook here and a uh, set of Faber-Castell graphite pencils. It's this graphite set that comes with uh, just a lot of really simple 2B pencils. So it's got, well, they're not all 2B, I shouldn't say that. It comes with a couple of 2Bs and this one really cool 9000 jumbo 2B pencil, which has a really nice weight to it. And I'll talk about that in a bit. And it also comes with this, uh, pure graphite uh, pencil here. So those are the two out of the set that we'll probably be using the most out of those pencils that were uh, on the supply list. And then I've got the, the eraser from that set. If you don't have that exact same set that was in the supply list, that is perfectly fine. Any uh, graphite pencils that you have will do. It just really want to make sure that you have some pencils that have uh, the letter B on them. So a two, 
2B, a 4B, 6B, 8B, any of those would be great. Um, and if you are unsure of what those numbers and letters on the side of the pencils mean, you can check out a, a class called a Beginner's Guide to Graphite that uh, Nicole can drop in, in the chat for you, or um, you can you know search for it on YouTube if you're just catching this later on YouTube as well. All right, and then, and so yeah, pretty straightforward little supply list here. And then I included these photos on the, the supply list as well. So there should be a PDF where uh, these three photos were included. So we've got one photo that is the true color image of the image that we're looking at, and then a black and white version of the image and then an inverted light version of the image. So that just means that the black and white has been reversed and all of the dark values are now showing up uh, black, or sorry, all of the dark values are showing up light and all of the light values are showing up dark. So it's just reversed and it's uh, really helpful. I'll talk about how helpful it can be as we get into it here. Um, but that was what was included. Um, so if there are no burning questions about supplies, I'm going to go ahead and get started here with a new fresh page. All right, so uh, one of the titles that I almost had for this class was uh, the painter's sketchbook, but I think I decided to edit that out. Um, or maybe the Michaels folks did, I can't recall because that's not what the title ended up being on uh, the website, but uh, the idea being that this is something that I do all the time in my sketchbook before I begin working on a painting. So we're leading in, what we're doing here is leading into this painting next week um, or this little painting study. And, uh, Oh my God, I meant to mark that page with a post-it. There it is, I found it again. Okay, so I can flip back and forth between my other example and my blank page here. So doing these little sketches in your sketchbook, these studies before you begin a painting is extremely beneficial. And one thing that you can do is just quick little thumbnails to get started. And I talk about those in a lot of previous classes. But in this class, we're going to really investigate our thumbnails. Usually a thumbnail is a small sketch that you do in your, your sketchbook that you maybe only spend two to five minutes on. But with these, we're going to really spend some time. So we're going to spend the entire hour and a half of tonight's class really doing these little thumbnail studies and fully investigating uh, this reference photo so we get a good understanding of the light, but this is something that's great to do before any painting. Uh, so to draw these little thumbnails and get them nice and exact, I'm going to use a post-it here. I've got these cool uh, graph post-its so I can trace a nice little square here. Since our image is square and we want two of them, I'm just going to get a couple of side by side squares going, oops. My friend Jenny Granberry, another teaching artist in the Austin area, showed me this trick in a, a class once and I really love it, just using a post-it to, or a business card to sketch a little uh, space a little thumbnail in your sketchbook so it's a nice little framed drawing that you don't need a ruler to to make it look nice there. Okay, so let's talk about the the inverted light versus the the black and white and why I think this can can be so helpful. So for one, when you go to paint something, oftentimes, uh, people can get really lost in uh, the details in the drawing and they can jump to the most, 
you know, specific details right away, and they don't follow that general to specific rule. And the general to specific is, is a rule in drawing where you start out with the most general shapes and, and then you work your way to more specific shapes, right? But people really struggle to start out that way or even knowing what the general shapes are that they're supposed to be looking at. So when you break it down to black and white, well, now we've Kind of just simplified it a little bit where the color is not distracting us and maybe we can see those shapes even more but then sometimes people still struggle to see what the shapes of the value are the dark value shapes and the light value shapes the shapes of the shadows and the shapes of the highlight highlights but then whenever we invert the photo it starts to become a little more clear whenever we can see it reversed like this, it becomes a lot more obvious where the absolute black uh, value shapes are. And sometimes inverting it does make it uh, seem a little bit more severe like this. And I know it's showing up really washed out on the Zoom, but you have the photos in the PDF. And even if you're watching later on YouTube, you should still have the reference photos in the uh, supply list there. If you just click under the YouTube video where it says see more um, dot 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 and you click on that and it'll show you the supply list and it'll show you the, the PDF. Um, but yeah, whenever you're looking at this photo, you can see there's a lot of subtle nuanced uh, shifts in between the this light and dark. I know it shows up as like all one searing white shape of the, these tree lines, but we can see these little shapes on here that show up dark. Well, those are actually the highlights, right? And all these little dark lines on the, the cliff uh, rocks here, the little cliff edge and these rocks on the side of the road, those are the highlights. And then everything that's showing up white, those are where all of the, the dark shadows are. And then it's really helpful for things like the perspective on the road. All we have to do is match this particular shape that we're seeing in the dark and, and light values, and we're going to be able to, to render this road. So before we get started doing these little studies, uh, I know some people are going to struggle with just some of the, the details of the, the contours and the elevation here. So I want to get into that uh, a little bit. Okay, so whenever we've got any form in space, any three-dimensional form, there are contours of that form. So those are the, the elevational lines of the form. And in a landscape, we obviously have elevation, like the elevation of a map will tell you about the elevation of that landscape, right? Uh, so when we're looking at this tree line, like let's just go ahead and sketch in on a separate piece of paper. We're just going to do a little study of this this tree line and then maybe the maybe even the whole thing. We'll get the mountains there and the background behind the tree line. The tree line comes up at a diagonal here. So we're just kind of do like, you know, a little diagonal line, like a little heart rate monitor all the way down for the tops of our trees. <clears throat> we don't need it to be exactly like the photograph. So just a little heart rate monitor diagonal line for the trees. And then over here, we'll do a similar little heart rate monitor line uh, for the trees that are coming into the, the side view over here. All right. And then we'll go ahead and just talk about the, the contours of the trees here. So within these trees, we've got this Christmas tree shape, right? But we can't see every tree. Some of them are being eclipsed by each other. They're, um, they're overlapping. So we don't see like the entire cone shape of all of these trees, but we essentially have a bunch of cone shapes here. And I'm just gonna draw my lines nice and dark. So they show up on the zoom. The sketch is just kind of a sketch to talk about the, the contours and the elevational lines here, all right? And then I'm just gonna exaggerate one of these over here as if we could see the whole thing. Let's think about like a you know, Christmas tree, right? So the Christmas tree is a cone. So we have, maybe we've got a straight vertical line down the center, but then it's gonna radiate out on the vertical axis like this if we were to sketch just the contour lines of the, the cone shape onto it. And then we've got this roundedness 
on the horizontal axis. And I'm just exaggerating the contour lines or the elevational lines of these trees. So all of these trees have a similar shape to them. And as we're sketching our value onto here, we really don't need to know anything else other than the value is gonna follow these contours. So as we're putting in our value shapes, it really doesn't matter if we even understand what these contour lines mean. As long as you get your value on here in a way that follows this elevational path, as long as we put these little highlights in, in a way that follows this rounded curve, it's going to feel like it's rounded to the viewer. So we're trying to create an optical illusion anytime we're drawing. We're trying to convince the person that's looking at the drawing that they're looking at the thing that we're suggesting with our lines and our shapes, uh, et cetera. So as long as we can convince them that they're looking at something that's cone shape and has the light hitting the side of these little sticky outy moments on the cone shape, they're gonna read it as, as this tree line. Okay, and then same thing with the, the mountains and the distance. There's lots of tiny little trees on here that we can't see uh, the shape of, but we can see the little dots sticking up. And then the shape or the contours of the elevation of this mountain is sloped. And we can see these little slopes, these diagonal lines kind of coming down in a lot of places here and the tree lines are following the this elevational path. And if we were to just exaggerate that, it's like a stretched out cone. So we've got these stretched out cone shapes that are also overlapping each other. It might be a little plateaued in some places. And then we've got these curved horizontals, although they're you know curving at different angles. Uh, but that's essentially what we've got going on back there on the mountain range. And all we really need to know about that is that our little st stippling dots that we're going to put in for the trees need to follow that little path of the, the contours. The value needs to follow the path of these contour lines. Okay, and then same thing with our road. So... We're gonna end up shading all this in with a bunch of value today, but I wanna make sure we understand what contour lines are and what I'm talking about when I reference them a bunch. Okay, so let's just look at our inverted light photo real quick and try to quickly get the, the shape of this road. We're gonna end up drawing the shape of this road a few different times. We've got essentially a straight line coming across right here. I say, as I draw a slightly curved line, and then we've got another angled line underneath that. And then we're really gonna concentrate on this little curve here and we're gonna end up drawing it a few times, but that's kind of it. And then we've got another little curved line right there. And then if I were to draw the contours of the road, well, the road is flat, but then it's curved, um, you know, going around this bend here. So we've got these straight lines on the surface of the road. That would be the contours on the horizontal axis. We've got mostly straight lines, right? And we can even see some of that in like stains on the road. And then the, the lines that are curving with the road coming towards us here. This is how I'm skirting around talking about linear perspective here. So we're not going to worry about the linear perspective that's involved in this photo. And we're just going to look at the contours and the elevational path here. So as long as you've got, a, you know, it starts over here in the corner and it, you get a little curve around this bend and a straight line here, then we just need to curve towards the bend and then have this line coming out at a diagonal and they just start curved until they get to the diagonal and then they're mostly diagonal lines until we hit the diagonal line. So that's the, the contours of the road over here on the side of the, the road. And if I'm going too fast for anyone, you can always watch the recording of the class later on YouTube and pause it and catch up to me uh, later. 
Uh, but for now, I'm just going to keep the pace I'm going because this is just my little preliminary sketch here to talk about contours. So same thing over here. We've got a straight line right about here uh, where the bend in the road is starting to happen. And then another curved line that matches the curve above it. And then another little curved line that starts about here. And that's really all we need for that. But then we've got some straight vertical lines sticking up here uh, for the, the posts on the, the guardrail. And then we've got some other straight lines within the guardrail as well. Those are straight vertical lines. They are straight up and down. So if you start to curve those at an angle, it's gonna make your perspective all wonky. So all you really need to know here is, you know, curving around this bend and then straight vertical lines uh, for the guardrail around that. And then from there, you're just following what the, the light shapes are telling us. And we've got another cone shape for this tree. So if I were to sketch, sketch out my little Christmas tree shape here, I could even start with something that feels like a stick, like a Charlie Brown stick Christmas tree, but then curve those lines around it to get that big vol voluminous, voluminous shape to it and get it to feel like a nice big rounded cone shape. And then from there, we're just making our value follow that curve. But we're going to spend most of our time tonight talking about the value. And if you are really struggling with the, the contour mapping here, then you can check out um, a class that Nicole has. She can drop in the chat on uh, just the, the basics of contour lines, looking at a piece of fruit, looking at a lime uh, from several months back. Okay, any questions about that, though, before we move on to our, our studies of the light? Doesn't seem like it. Okay, so let me flip back to my blank page here. I should have left a space in between that page and my drawing underneath that's peeking through. I'm gonna do this. Okay, so. I'm going to mainly use this jumbo pencil for the entire class if I didn't say that already. I'm pretty sure I did, but um, I really like the weight of this pencil and uh, there's something about the a big pencil like this that keeps you uh, from doing something that is really challenging for beginning artists to uh, to stop doing, which is holding your pencil like a writing utensil, like maybe it's comfortable to hold your pencil like this, but I feel like when you get a pencil like this in your hand, something about it makes you want to hold it further towards the back and use the side of it, or maybe hold it at some different angles because it's a little awkward in your hand. So maybe you hold it like this and holding your pencil in different ways like that really gets you to uh, start to explore different kinds of, of mark making, especially in regards to value. And it also, it just helps you soften uh, your lines. Okay, so I'm gonna start sketching again here and I'm gonna sketch really light to get just the basic idea of our landscape in here again. So really just the bones of what we just sketched on that other page. And I really stretched it out before, but now I'm gonna make it fit within this uh, square. And it might be kind of hard to see my lines uh, for a moment until I start adding the value. So um, if you could just stick with me and be patient while I uh, get my sketch mapped out here again, once I start adding the value, it'll show up. But all I'm doing is sketching in just the line of the trees, the mountain range, this tree and the road, just those basic shapes that we, we started with in that preliminary sketch together. And it's totally fine if our landscapes do not perfectly match the photograph, as long as we get all the things in there, we should be good. 
Um, one way, now that I'm back to the, the square frame here to ensure that we get the perspective right on this guardrail is if you want to look at where the guardrail starts in the, the corner of the photograph itself, it comes out of like we've got the corner of the square, right? And then just about quarter of, of an inch or maybe a couple centimeters out from that corner, we can start to draw this little hook. Uh, shape or not hook shape, hook line. So I'm gonna start right there, and then I'm just gonna draw a little little hook like the top of a candy cane. And then I'm gonna draw my straight line for the side of that guardrail, and then just make it wrap around like that, and that's it. And it might not show the same amount of the guardrail in your sketch. It might be a little different. And then we're just gonna have it kind of curve around and diminish a little bit right there. So maybe you edit out part of the guardrail and that's totally fine. And then from this little point where the guardrail goes around that bend in our tree, we're just gonna draw a straight line right here, not too dark because we wanna leave space for that car. So maybe leave a little gap there where the car shows up. And then we'll have that kind of slightly diagonal line right there. And then we've got that other diagonal line. But again, we wanna leave a little gap for where the car shows up. We'll talk about an easy way to sketch that car in just a bit. Okay. And then let's go ahead and put in these rocks here and that will help us see like if the car is in the right place. So we can put the little rocks where they show up right there at about the spot where the car is. And then I'm just gonna do that little heart rate monitor thing to get the line of the rocks in there. And then maybe we start to look at some of these dark shapes that are sticking out. You could look at the inverted light um, image here. Well, no, let's stick to looking at the black and white. So we're going to go ahead and label these before we get too far. So this is the black and white. Yeah, before we get too far here, let's distinguish between our two sketches. So black and white and then our inverted light. So let's stick to our black and white image here. So we don't break our brains because it is a bit of a confusing switch if we bounce back and forth between them too much. So I'm looking at the shapes of the shadows that I'm seeing in the black and white photo and just putting in a little bit of some of those tree shapes, but really just to continue, um, you know, making sure that I've got the rocks in the right place. Okay, and then We'll go ahead and draw our little car and we're going to do the car really simple here. Actually, let me draw the car a little bigger on a separate sheet of paper so that I can kind of zoom in on it a little bit. So without worrying about, I mean, because the car's really far away. This is how I'm reading it. It's a rectangle. I'm really simplifying it here. But this is how I drew it in my sketchbook, and this is how I'm going to draw it when we do the gouache uh, painting next week as well. So rectangle, another skinny rectangle on top of that, another little skinny rectangle on top of that. But this one's going to go in kind of like a little hexagon right on top of there. And then we do two little squares off the bottom. And then we're gonna do the little shape of the license plate and the bumper like that. And then we're gonna end up shading it in, but I'm just gonna go ahead and shade it in right now so you can see it come to life a little bit. So I realize my light is getting washed out. So big rectangle, smaller rectangle, hexagon, two squares underneath it. And then we'll shade all that in once we start adding our value. So if you wanna jump ahead, to that, we're just doing this on a smaller scale here. So 
we got our, and we just want to place it where it makes sense in the, you know, you don't want it looming super high up here by the rocks. You want it just slightly coming above the guardrail. So we've got our little rectangles, our little squares, little license plate. And if you want to go ahead and shade it in now, something like that. Okay, we're not going to spend too much time on that car. And then we'll put that big grease spot down the center of the lane. Coming out like this, I'm using the soft side of my pencil to get some nice soft tonal shading in there. And then this is the one that I'm going to hook around the same direction uh, towards the guardrail. All right, so now we've got pretty much the entire bones uh, of the sketch in here. And I realized I kept it super light, but it is super light back here on the uh, mountain range. So I don't want to press down too hard on my pencil there. Otherwise it's going to be darker than I want it. But I do want to put a little bit of cl these clouds, this cloud line that we see up here. So, cause that's going to be fun when we invert it. So it's dark in the black and white photo. So we'll have just a little line for those dark clouds up there. Okay, so let's start filling in some of this value on the black and white photo first, and then we'll we'll jump to the inverted light photo and we'll have to, you know, switch. We'll have to flip it mentally and visually. But first, <clears throat> we'll just look at the, the true light in the black and white here. All right, so we've got this value scale from zero to 10, zero being our absolute uh, white and 10 being our absolute black and that class on uh, the beginner's graphite to or sorry beginner's guide to graphite and value uh, talks about this if that concept is brand new to you um, so and we also talked about tonal shading in that class as well and so tonal shading is just smooth, continuous shading. And that's what we're gonna use for the entire class here to add our values. I like to start with my tens on the value scale, the absolute black, and then work my way towards the light. And that you might wanna do it differently than that, but this is just the way I feel like it's easier to let up on my pressure. So I'm gonna start in the darkest dark areas that I see, which is right here in between these trees uh, behind the rocks, I see that it gets to an absolute 10 on the, the value scale, absolute black inside of the shadows of the trees. And then over here, and it kind of sticks up um, and some of these little leaves that are sticking up and uh, some of these trees get to a, a solid 10, definitely in the shadows right here on the back of the truck, a little bit on the guardrail. Those are all those places where it gets to an absolute 10. And you can see when we switch to the inverted light that there's a stark difference between, um, you know, where the white is showing up in those places. So that's where we're seeing that, that absolute black. Okay, so we'll start inside of, of those shadows and use our side of our pencil to start shading in there and we're following those contours as we're adding this value kind of following that that Christmas tree shape up the side here and maybe even thinking about like a, a zigzag line that comes down from the in the shadows to the light and it alternates between shadow and light within that zigzag path and I'm just using the side of my pencil to shade it in. You could even use this pure graphite, the 6B, if you wanted to go even darker, or if you had, you know, some darker pencils, they're gonna show up a little darker for these, but I like starting nice and soft with a 2B like this. And like I said, I just like this jumbo pencil because it really forces me to hold it at an angle like this, like I've got it parallel to the paper. So I'm keeping nice and soft with my value the whole time. Okay, so that's where I'm seeing that it's getting that dark and I can always make it darker. 
And then the other thing I like about the jumbo pencil is now I'm kind of coming at it from a different angle. Like I'm holding my pencil like this now from the bottom. And so I want you to try that. I want you to try holding your pencil from some different angles and see how you might have more control holding it at, you know, approaching the, the paper from a different angle. You maybe are able to be softer or keep it parallel to the paper like that if you come at it from a, a different angle. But we're just following that zigzag path down the side of the trees where we're seeing that really dark value. Over here, this one tree gets super dark right above the car. It's so dark that it makes the value on the car seem lighter in some places. So I'm really just going to bounce around to all these places where I'm seeing this 10 on the value scale and start to put that value in. And now I'm bouncing over here. Everywhere where I'm seeing it get to an absolute black. And it may get darker than this, but this is just my first little layer of graphite to start to establish all of those dark values. And I'm following the contours as I'm doing that, following that little elevational shift that we talked about on the tree line. And then I'll bounce over here to this tree in the foreground. And there's this big gaping hole in the center of this tree where it gets nice and dark. And then we've got that same sort of zigzag path of dark value in this tree. I really drew more of this tree than what is visible in the, the photograph. So I might adjust a little bit here. Okay, so this is going to be so helpful next week when we're painting this because I mean, we're going to be painting it in two tones and knowing where we have these absolute black shapes are really going to help us to know where we're going to put the darker color that we're using. And when we get to this next week, um, I'm going to suggest that you maybe not use the same two colors that I did, even though I am a big fan of this pink and blue, so I'm totally fine if other people do the same thing. But you maybe might want to try it with some other colors, like I tried it with blue and yellow first, and I definitely like the pink and blue better, but it was a good exercise for my brain trying to reverse it with, with those colors as well. I think it turned out nicer, so that's why I used that example for the class, but the two things that I find make people give up in the painting process, which is why I wanted to make this class that I had originally called the, the painter's sketchbook. Um, the, cause the two things that I see people run into in the painting process and in all my classes, I've been teaching adults for 10 years now, since 2014, I started teaching drawing and painting classes to adults. And uh, people often join a painting class because they think it's easier than drawing. They're like, well, I hate to draw, but here I am in the painting class. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, <laughs> the first thing I'm gonna suggest that you do if you're struggling with painting that is draw it, right? And then they tend to get frustrated and wanna sign up for a drawing class. And so, yeah, being unable to, uh, to sketch the or render the thing that they're painting. And so taking the time to draw it is definitely gonna help you be able to paint it. And then the other thing is mixing and matching the colors that they see in, 
in a painting, like being able to match the, these particular greens and not making it all the same green uh, is, is something that people struggle with. Um, we've definitely had uh, lots of classes that have talked about uh, color mixing and matching in, in painting, and I plan to have more coming coming soon. So if you're like, well, wait, I want a class on that, stay tuned for that in the months ahead. Um, but I wanted to address, as I get into more painting classes, the, uh, you know, just how to resolve issues with, with drawing something. Okay, so we got our tens on the value scale in there. Now let's start to look at where we're seeing like some seven, eights, and nines on the value scale. Although actually we missed a few tens because that's where in the inverted light photo, we see these little white moments here on the cliff edge. So there are some moments on the, the little rocks and cliffs here that are showing up pretty black. And actually there's even more of them over here. But yeah, having this high contrast between the, the dark and light also really helps your drawings and paintings pop and stand out. Whenever people stay in the mid-tones of a drawing through or a painting, it tends to feel, you know, just not very dynamic or dramatic. And you can always exaggerate the drama in the light that you're seeing in a photograph to make it more interesting. That way you can turn up the contrast in the, the editing function of a photo if it just doesn't have a lot of high contrast or when you're drawing and painting it, you can push the contrast. Okay, so that's pretty good for now for the those tens on the value scale. So now we're gonna look where we're seeing our like sevens, eights and nines. So where it gets to almost black, but not a solid black. And that would be this entire tree line, right? And we could have just started out shading out the, just shading in the entire tree line like this, but then we wouldn't already have that, that drama that we're starting to create, right? So as we do this, rather than just filling it in as, you know, one just you know, just going all the way across with like a diagonal or a, a horizontal line, I'm going to put it in in a way that follows those contours. So I'm kind of starting at the top of those cone shapes and I'm swirling my pencil around. So again, I'm approaching with this jumbo pencil from the north now coming in from the top of the paper and swirling it around to cover the that three-dimensional shape of the trees in a way that follows those contours and is starting to match that value. And when you're painting, you can do the same thing. You can follow the directional path or the contour lines with your brush strokes, and that's going to really suggest to the viewer that they're looking at a three-dimensional form there. Okay, and we'll do that here in the foreground as well, but we're going to leave a little bit of space here where we're seeing those highlights. And maybe we even erase out a few of our highlights here. Just realized another thing that would have been nice on the, the supply list is one of those erasers that comes in a pencil like the, I have one in my bag and I'm, and they sell them at Michael's, I've used them in a previous class before, um, I'm blanking on the name of the brand that, that makes them, but y'all can put it in the chat if you remember. If you have one of those, you can erase out some of those, those little detail shapes, but I'm just trying to be mindful as I'm putting my value in to leave a little gap there, leave the paper blank where I'm seeing that light. Okay, and then here on the guardrail, we've got a little shadow sticking up on the vertical and it gets pretty dark in some places. So that heart rate monitor definitely applies again right here. 
if we're having that go up in the direction of the, the guardrail, it maybe comes in at a slant. You could even add some other lines at a slant here. And then on the road itself, it stays pretty light, but some of these little oil stains on the this one that hooks right here, it's a little darker in some places. And I'm using horizontal lines to fill in that value so that it follows that flat path of the road that we talked about. And you know, if you go too dark, you can always erase it out and put it in again. I think I kind of went a little dark, I accidentally erased some of my other guardrail there. I find it's really helpful. Students always tell me they like it when they see me erasing out a big chunk of my drawing because I've been told even this week, people saying, I liked seeing how much you weren't afraid to erase part of your drawing and draw it again because people tend to get really attached to their lines and think that they, you know, just don't want to erase them. And I definitely have been there and I identify with that, but it's not something that I do too much anymore. Okay, so we're, we're really getting there on the black and white one. We've almost filled in all of our value on this one. Let's go ahead and jump up here to the clouds. So now that we've used a lot of pressure on these darker values, it might be easier to let up on that pressure. Although some people have an easy time starting out with light pressure and then increasing the pressure, but we'll go ahead and fill in that shadow for that kind of foggy cloud that's coming into the top frame of the photo here. And then we've got to look at these this mountain back here. So that's where we've got all these little dots. It might be easier to look at the true light uh, photo here, the one that's in full color for these because the black and white kind of washes this out. But this is where we're looking at those, those little vertical patching lines for the trees in the distance. And we're making those come in in a way that follow the elevational path of those contours. And that's really how we're gonna fill in all of this value. It's with these little, little vertical lines that almost feel like stippling dots, but there's still little vertical lines all representing these trees at a distance. And if you want even more of a separation, we can come in on the, the side of our pencil and do a really light. This is going to be more like a two or a three on that value scale, just a really light value. There, but then that kind of washed out some of my my cute little vertical lines. So I'm going to put them back in. All right. And then I'm going to fill in this darker value on this tree, still following that. The contour path there, making them radiate out. Got a little shadow falling across the, the grass here. And maybe you use just like some horizontal value here to fill in the grass. And we've got these vertical lines on the guardrail that we talked about. And looking at our black and white, it gets really black right here on the bottom of the guardrail. And then again, at the top, it gets super dark. And we've got some really dark value here at the edge of the tree where it meets this guardrail. 
and more vertical lines there. And a little bit of a dark value sticking up on those posts. And there's a really white moment of some leaves here, like a flowering plant. And then it gets really black behind that. So having that high contrast between some stuff with more detail in the foreground is going to create depth in our drawing sketch here. And likewise, if you were going to do a, a bigger study of this, a more detailed study on a bigger sheet of paper, you would want to put a lot more detail on all of these little leaves that we're seeing in the foreground. Like we're mostly just concentrating on the light and value shapes here. But obviously we can see all of this light value on this tree in the foreground. We can't see that kind of detail on these middle ground trees, right? We can see less and less detail on these middle ground trees. You just see these smaller little shapes. We still see the shapes, but they're smaller, they're less distinct. And then way back here, all we're seeing is maybe like a line of value at the side of that tree. We're definitely not seeing little individual shapes here, but people often struggle with value on trees, wanting to draw like every specific leaf on the tree. And the easier thing to do is to sketch just the overall shape of the shadows that you're seeing within the, the, the leaves on the tree. Understanding the contours of the tree itself and then the value shapes that are happening within that tree. Okay, so now that we've got pretty much everything in the black and white photo in here, I'm going to switch to, oh, I forgot to put the lighter value on the rocks. So the same thing we did on the mountains, I'm just going to kind of leave some gaps for where I'm seeing those highlights, but go in and fill in with the side of my pencil to get some of that, that vertical value to come in, those little jagged vertical lines. The heart rate monitor thing comes in very helpful as a way to, to fill in a lot of parts of this drawing. Okay, and then I'm going to switch to the 6B so that I can really push some of these dark values and create even more contrast here. I'm going to go back to all the places where it got to a 10 on the value, and this is where I'm really going to push the drama. And the only reason I didn't start with this one was because one, I wanted y'all to hopefully have that same jumbo pencil, even though it's totally fine if you didn't, but just see like how there's something kind of meditative about using the same pencil for the majority of a drawing. It's also a nice reminder that we can get a lot done with just one pencil and we can get all of those values in there. Sometimes it can be, um, you know, a little overwhelming to feel like we need all of those pencils or they're all necessary, but we just did almost that entire drawing with that 2B jumbo pencil. And now all we're doing is pushing our really dark values with a 6B or maybe an 8B, whatever you have that's darker. Even a, a 4B would be fine. Anything that's darker than that 2B so we can get in here and really push the drama a little more and then yeah on the truck we want it to get nice and black on the back of the truck so it stands out And then there was that one really dark moment behind the truck and this tree, this area, that's pretty dark. And then over here, all those places that really just stand out as the darkest value. 
And then this is where we'll get a few individual leaves in on these trees, but we're just going to sketch them as little, little dots that are sticking out to form these branches. So just a little pile of dots that stick out to form that shape. And then we'll do the same thing all the way up on our tree line. Maybe you switch back to the other pencil if they're standing out a little too dark. I'm just controlling the pressure here. I'm not pressing down quite as hard, but we want to have some of these little sticky outy moments at the tops of the trees here. And then especially here on these other foreground trees that are closest to us. So I didn't make a big fuss about atmospheric perspective, but that is essentially what we've just illustrated here. The effect of the atmosphere on space over distance. You know, we see overlapping, we see things diminishing in size. We see a haziness on uh, things that are far away, less distinct, less detail. All of those things we just illustrated by just focusing on the light. And I teach a lot of in-person classes where I cover all these concepts. And, you know, like, for example, I'm teaching a portrait drawing class right now on, on Tuesday mornings. And I'm teaching about facial proportions and the three dimensions of the head and all, all the stuff that goes along with drawing our live models in the class and people get so overwhelmed with all of that stuff. And I try to say all the time, you know, the light is telling you everything you need to know. You can ignore perspective in this landscape. You can ignore contours. It's good to be aware of them, but the light is telling us everything we need to know about what we're trying to draw here just looking at the light and the shapes of the light and then filling in those shapes with the appropriate pressure on the same pencil will get the job done. Okay, so now I think we're ready to switch to our inverted light version of this photograph. And we're gonna get a cool effect here because we're gonna draw the inverted light image. So it's not going to look realistic. It's going to be the opposite. It's not even going to look exactly like the opposite because when we invert the light, some things get a little lost here. Um, so we'll start out with the same sort of shapes, um, that diagonal line for the tree line, the line of the, the mountains and the distance and the shapes of our um, our leaves in the foreground here and the shape of the road and the, the rocks. We're going to start out with just the, the vague idea of all of that. But actually, before I forget, I don't want to forget to do this at the end of the next drawing, too. This is a fun little trick for a fun page in your sketchbook. We're going to erase the frame on the, the image that we sketched. So just erase that line that we drew with the post-it and just let the value float there by itself. And hopefully you didn't draw that line too dark that you can't erase it. I don't know if you noticed that I did that with the other one, the other example, but I'll flip back to it in just a second so you can see how it looks with both of them. And you know, if you accidentally erase the clouds when you do that, you know, just put the clouds back in. Boy, this little sketchbook has gotten very full. So there's my 
other example where I erased those erase those lines at the edge so it's just kind of floating there I don't know I thought it made a, a neat little effect maybe it's not that noticeable but anyway okay so moving on to the inverted light version here start out with the same same bones and then back to my jumbo 2b pencil let me make sure I get this a little farther over here. I kind of imagined that that tree was coming in a little farther in than it actually was. And then it took up more space where the guardrail was as well. But like I said, totally fine if the proportions are a little off. I think the only thing that would be noticeable if the proportions were super off would be if you made the car too big. All right. And then... We'll start in our little corner, right, from our corner to get the guardrail. We're just going to start right here and make our little hook and then our straight line and then complete the other edge. And same thing on that side. Okay, and then for the road. We got the diagonal line, slightly diagonal line, and then the other slightly diagonal line on top of that. Whoops, made that too too wide. So it starts out really narrow and then gets a little wider so we can get some of that, that value on the opposite side of the guardrail there. And then we've got another little curved hooked line right here that gets wider as it comes towards us. Okay, and then, yeah, we wanna leave a little space for our car. I'm just gonna erase out a little rectangle there for the car, but I'm gonna put in the, the rocks first. The rocks really help me to make sure I don't make that car too big. Can y'all tell I've drawn this a few times? <laughs> you saw I did it in green and yellow. I did it in pink and blue. I've sketched this thing a few times. I also did a acrylic study of the same image. This photo is very old too. It's funny how much use I can get out of a single reference image. Sometimes I took this photo on. Well, I wrote it at the bottom of, of the study for next week, Pacific Northwest Highway on the road from Seattle to Bellingham, Washington. So if anybody in the class tonight is from that area, you'll have to tell me in the chat. My um, ex-husband had a, a writing career that took him, I mean, he still does. Um, well, no, he actually doesn't anymore, but anyway to have a writing convention he would go to in that area. And I had some family up there, so we used to visit uh, quite a bit. I love that part of the country. It looks like it makes so much sense that they've got that troll in Seattle because it just looks like a troll is going to walk out of, step right over onto the road while you're driving down the highway. All right, so... Getting some of those diagonal lines in there for the, the little jagged zigzag lines for those tree lines, but mostly I'm leaving it kind of bare. I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself again with that. All right, let's do the car. So we're reversing the light on the car. This is where, I mean, it, hopefully it doesn't hurt your brain too much to reverse the light like this because we're just looking at the inverted light photo now. So I wouldn't advise trying to look at the black and white photo and, you know, mentally reverse it. We're just going to look at our inverted light photo and see where we're seeing black. So I see black where there was that highlight on the back of the, the truck. And then there was the, um, so everywhere we're putting black is actually where the light is, right? I might've just said that wrong. I get, so I get, 
very confused. That's why I'm like, just keep looking at the reference to, to stay grounded here. So where we're drawing black in the inverted light photo is actually where the light is. So this is all we've got of the car. I'm just, just drawing what I see in the inverted light photo there. Okay, and then now down the center of the road where we did leave everything blank on the last drawing, that's where we're gonna shade it in. So we want a double line for this, this oil stain path on the road. And then we're gonna leave the oil stains white and we're going to shade all around them and this is where the contours of the road really come into play because we didn't we only had a little bit of this in the last uh in the black and white version and this is where i'm taking my arm and i'm like curling it around my page here and that way i'm coming in from this angle and it's a lot easier for me to just get that horizontal value to happen so remember how we illustrated the, the contours of the road using the, the horizontal uh, contours. Now I'm filling in that dark value in between the oil. Lines. Yeah, just coming towards myself. All right, and that is going to probably get a little darker than that, but we'll start there. And then this is where you really see the contours of the guardrail. It's kind of hard to tell that this is more of like a diagonal um, contour here. I think we made it a little flat in the last one, but we definitely want more of like some diagonal value coming in on the guardrail because it's like slanted like this and it's easy to not notice that in the true light. Well, let's see. No, you can see it in the true light, but the black and white kind of washed it out. So the inverted light really helps with noticing all these shapes of, of shadows and light and how they do illustrate uh, the contours. All right, and then I'm gonna go kind of fast here, honestly, because we're leaving a lot of the, the tree line blank um, but let's go ahead and fill in the value that we do see on the edge of these trees with a slight little soft tonal value. So what we're actually illustrating here are those highlights. And we're just putting all those highlights in, but we're shading them dark because we're looking at the opposite value. And I do this with almost every photo reference that I use. I was doing it with a lot of the, the draw club uh, sessions that we've been doing on Saturday mornings. I was including reference images for those and I've got recordings available for all of those draw club sessions. It's basically just a draw along with me up until recently, I've been making them more uh, choose your own adventure based, but from January until uh, the end of March, all of those sessions were, you know, I'd provide reference images and then we just all sketch them together and I would invert the light um, on all of them. Sometimes I'd make them sepia, black and white. So if you were to purchase any of those class uh, draw club session recordings, I'll send you those reference images and you can follow along with the recordings of those. And then now we're starting to do some stuff that's more, more collaborative, but we'll see. I may go back to the, the draw club where we, we all draw the same thing again soon. It did seem like that was maybe a little more popular. Um, but I think the still life swap we have planned for, for this weekend sounds fun too. So I'm gonna see how that goes first. Anyway, um, but I do this in a lot of the Michaels classes as well. A lot of the class images that I provide, I, I invert the light for those because it just helps to be able to see these value shapes when you invert it like this. Okay, I maybe went a little, a little farther than I'm seeing in the inverted light. It's really subtle, but there is 
you know, a little bit of these highlights even back here. So we kind of left our paper blank where we saw this, but when we paint this, this is where we'll be adding, you know, the lighter paint. Okay, so it's a little trickier to do the uh, the tree line moments up here with the inverted light. I'm just gonna jump to my my other example real quick. One second, y'all. I moved my post-it, so it's harder to get back to it. Okay. So yeah, we're gonna sketch kind of the overall shape up there and then we're gonna shade in like little keyhole spaces. So it, it's not gonna be perfect. We're gonna we're gonna do as best we can with it. Oh my God, I just lost it again. Oh, I'll go back to it again in a bit. Okay, so this time let's sketch in our clouds. That's where we're gonna leave it blank is where the clouds are. And I know I haven't gotten to this other tree over here. I'll come back to it. Okay, so let's sketch in just like another little heart rate monitor thing. But this time, like, really give yourself a good little peek to each one. Give yourself a lot of little peeks. Little pointed tops to all of those trees. Okay, and then we're just going to fill in the sky. And this time I'm going to turn my paper this way and I'm going to come at it from the side. And I'm still looking at my inverted light photo to help me. I'm just doing some soft tonal shading all the way up from that cloud line down to the tree line and the mountains, which, oh my God, did I not sketch in my mountains yet? Hang on. And when we're painting, we're gonna start with uh, the background and work our way forward. But definitely anytime you've got sky and trees in a drawing, if you've got a dark sky, which in the inverted light photo, it appears dark. Um, if you've got any kind of pigment or anything in the sky that's going to show up behind the tree, like through the little keyhole moments between the leaves, you want to put that in first because it's really hard to go back and draw a sky in between the, the keyhole moments, but that's kind of what we're challenging, challenging ourselves to do a little bit here with the inverted light, but not much because we're really just going to the tops of those little points. And then, oops, went off screen a little bit. So I'm just keeping it all nice and continuous and keeping my my tonal shading going in the same direction, keeping it horizontal the whole time so that it's all creating that optical illusion that it's connected. And it gets pretty dang dark in the inverted light photo. So I'm gonna go over it again and put push down on my pressure a little bit more here and really get that value to show up nice and dark. So I can create some drama again in the inverted light image. You might even do this with a darker pencil if the 2B isn't getting the job done enough for you. Okay, and then we'll just go inside of our little, I'm just looking at the inverted light photo again, going inside of there to get some of those little dark sky moments to peek through. So it, it might not look exactly like the photograph, but we're going to get it as close as we can. And the inverted light is a little easier to do with the paint next week because we can just, you know, gouache is very opaque. We can go back in with our lighter color and put it over that darker sky and get that effect to happen with our paint a little easier. So it's a good little challenge for our brains and for our hand muscles in our drawing practice here. 
And then if you did like me and went super dark with your little keyhole moments, then maybe you want to darken your sky again even more. But we really only have to go about that far, right? Because then we've got the mountains there. And then we're looking at the inverted light photo still, so don't want to get too confused going back and forth. Um, so here we need a value that is, it's still a value. It's maybe a two or three on the value for the, um, the mountains, but then we want darker for the, the trees that are, well, the trees are actually what is lighter on the mountain. So we're actually, what we're making darker is the space in between the trees. Okay. So this is another reason why we need our sky to be pretty dark. So I'm going to go even darker with my sky real quick. That way I can still do a nice little value shaded across the whole mountain, but it's not, you know, if our sky was too light, then it would be hard to have a separation between uh, the mountain and the the sky. And the zoom is just really having a hard time picking up my lines right now. So I'm tilting my paper for you. Okay. And then here we're going to shade in some of that darker value that we're seeing in between the trees. So the purpose of this, again, it's just really helpful. It's a good challenge, good exercise, but it's really helpful to see those shapes. Like if we were to have um, go back to drawing the black and white one now, it would maybe be a lot easier. And maybe you're like, we should have started with this, but I think this would be more challenging if we started with this. I think having the understanding of the black and white, they both inform each other. So, but yeah, then we need to also have a good amount of value here coming up next to this tree so that we can do those little keyhole moments of where we're seeing the value in between the leaves over here. And again, it doesn't have to look perfect. We're just trying to get the idea of it, just exercise in our brains. This is like CrossFit for our brains right now. Okay, and then we'll get some of these highlights on the, the trees which are actually looking like shadows, but we know that they're highlights. Okay, and then this really white flowering tree over here, remember it shows up yellow in the true color. That's what's showing up nice and dark. And then that highlight on the top of the guardrail shows up nice and dark. And those highlighted little posts they show up nice and dark and then you're maybe noticing like I am right now I need to darken up that road to make it match the values in the the inverted photo so I'll go ahead and do that now and yeah you can you don't have to come in at that same angle each time if you want to go in more you know noticing the the vertical diagonals of the space here. I think just a quick way to get that rolling was to kind of hook our arms around and do that horizontal line. Also, the, that's just part of drawing that I feel like I'm trying to share with my students as I progress as a teacher. I just think about all those things that nobody ever told me when I was learning how to draw. Nobody ever told me to try holding my pencil at different angles and approach the paper from a different angle. That was just something I started doing the more I, the deeper I got into my drawing practice. And then I started noticing how many, you know, impressive artists that I follow on Instagram, I see them doing the same thing. And I'm like, huh, nobody ever suggested that I do that. That was just something that came after years of practice. It just made sense to do that. And I notice whenever I tell, um, you know, my drawing students who can 
respond back to me. I know here on Michael's, you'll just have to put any feedback in the chat, but um, people tell me like, wow, I almost feel like I'm breaking, like somebody said recently, they felt like they were breaking the rules somehow doing that. Like, like, <laughs> like it's wrong to hold their paintbrush or their pencil at these weird different angles. Like, like they needed permission to do that somehow. And I thought that was really funny. Um, so yeah, maybe that's why I want to share it so that you, it doesn't take you years of doing your own thing to be like, Hey, let me try this. Maybe this will be cool. You can just start trying it and see how much it helps your, your muscle control. It really helps you to get different marks to happen. It's hard to make a lot of variety of marks happen or different values happen if we're always holding our pencil the same way. You know, you're not giving yourself a whole lot of variation in your, your muscle um, memory. All right, about nine minutes left. That's a good stopping point where we are. I'm just adding a few little details like some of these darker moments in the inverted light where those highlights are showing up on the rocks I'm just pushing those a little bit more but I think that's a pretty good place to land and I just think it looks so cool too all right so I'm going to erase my frame again and then I will probably need to erase some of my left-handed smudging that has happened throughout approaching this from so many different angles. You can also just turn your paper in different directions too to keep to keep it easier to do certain things. It's definitely easier to erase from this other angle out smudging. All right, so now we got our cool little floaty inverted and black and white sketches. I'd love to see some of y'all's sketches. We've got seven minutes here, so if there's any questions, let me check out the chat. I don't see any questions, um, but you if you have any questions now, it would be a good time to, to ask them or we can I'll just let um, Nicole spotlight you and we can look at some of your examples. Do you want to hold them up? All right, there's Barbara's. Really nice. That's so fun. And there's Emma. Oh, I love the stylized quality of your, your trees, Emma. That's really nice. Yeah. It looks really dramatic. I'm excited to see you paint that in that same style. I hope you'll join us next week for the painting class. All right, this is Andrea G. Hold it back just a little bit. Well, I can see that black and white one now nice and close. Hold it back so I can see the inverted one a little better. Okay, yeah, that's looking lovely. And here's Sandra. Yeah, it really feels dramatic how you went so dark with your dark values on the black and white. That's a really nice one, Sherry. Yeah, I feel like it like takes me a second like, looking back and forth between the, the two of them. Those are so fun. Yeah, you've got a really nice stylized quality. I'm really feeling the depth in that one too, going around the bend. You really did a great job showing that, that diminishing size around the, the corner there. All right, and this is one, nice, very nice one. Yeah, sorry, it's just taking me a second to like look and back, bam, looking back and forth between the two of them and just noticing things. It definitely takes me a second to like, you know, just interpret the inverted light and then the, the black and white. Oh, that's a lovely stylized one too. Wow, y'all did such a cool job illustrating these in different styles. It's so fun to see the, the different approaches to stylized quality that you added. Nice. All right, well, 
Well, we finished early. That's so rare. Um, let me see if we've got some some comments or questions. Um, oh, Emma said she's not available for next week's class, but you can watch the recording. Okay, cool. Well, maybe you'll have to share um, after the recording if you make a call. I'd love to see that painted in that style. Um, yeah, I love seeing everybody's work too. All right. Well, I guess we will just end it uh, a little early if nobody has any questions or, or comments. Um, thank you all, all so much. And yeah, hopefully if you can't join next week for the, the gouache class, then there will always be a recording on the uh, on YouTube the next day. So next Thursday after we record that class. Um, oh yeah, and Nicole said, don't forget to use those hashtags, learn with Michaels, make it with Michaels and Michaels classes when you're sharing your pictures on social media. Um, or, and you can tag me too, because sometimes I don't always see things with those hashtags, but if somebody tags me directly, um, then I'll, I'll definitely see it. Um, all right. And yeah, there's my link tree again, if you want to sign up for, I've also got the link in my link tree to sign up for future Michael's classes. So that'll take you directly to that or or the other stuff that I have going on outside of Michael's class. I've also got in-person classes in the Austin area at the Contemporary Austin Art School at Laguna Gloria. That's such a long name, uh, but that's where I'm teaching in-person classes these days. Okay, well, thank you all so much again and have a wonderful rest of, of your evening. Good night and thank you, Nicole.